Our next reader, when asked, uh, her, when asked about her thoughts on astrology, said she doesn't believe any of it. Um, and thinks it's ridiculous that people structure their lives, dating, and friendship around astrology. Um, with that said, though, she noted that she does not fuck with Geminis. Um, born on June 27th, this makes her a Cancer. Um, and since my mother is a Cancer, I fear all of them. Um, <laughs> Those born on June 27th believe that the most effective uh, offense is supported by a good defense. That's fair. Extremely protective of their personal kingdom, be it family or business, they venture out into the world cautiously and only after their home base is secure from external threats. Once their guidance system is locked on, however, they proceed inexorably to their target, rarely straying off course. Um, those born on this day are likely to suffer from physical rigidity that can manifest itself in discomforts from headaches and backaches to quite crippling disorders like arthritis. Um, this, this is my favorite part. They must also guard against stress-induced gastric and duodenal ulcers. Um, <laughs> Um, their strengths, they are convincing, determined, and protective. Their weaknesses, um, they are rigid, closed, and isolationist. Um, also, Helen Keller was also born on this day. Um, <laughs> advice for people born on June 27th? Um, loosen up a bit, period. Um, <laughs> please welcome Aaron Piasecchi. Wow, that was a very effective roast. Thank you. Um, hey. sh Jordan did promise me that he would shine a light in my eyes and blind me, so somebody's really dropped the ball. <sighs> okay, so uh, this is all part of a longer piece, and it's just kind of a patchwork, so yeah, here are some puzzle pieces. I mix metaphors, so what? Okay. <laughs> Void. The husk of the calf is rotting on the front lawn. Writhing maggots in solid clusters of white, hister beetles, sheeny, and onyx feasting. Belly up among browning grass, halved almost too neatly where the bugs had picked flesh from bone. She sees it from her navy rental sedan, pulled midway up the gravel drive. It is the gone half that faces her, a gnarled mess of innards made external, uncoiled bowels like snakes, a streamer explosion from the gut. Emptied, it lies in front of the moldering section of picket fence. Then there is her father. Inside, collapsed rigid on the linoleum, staring up milky-eyed. He is all there. Entrails still gathered under the distended curve of stomach, skin stretched thin with blood. Only the pigment of him is unseemly, flesh patterned in cross sections of purple and red, a smear of mustard around the mouth, spoiling incrementally to umber. Later, among the filigreed urns and chintz lockets, they ask if she wants to see him once more, before they burn him, make him permanently void. She glances only once, then gives a terse shake of her head and looks away. There is nothing to see, nothing at all, nothing but framework, that fetid calf slowly wasting. One. She had never meant to go back there, had sworn she would have to be dragged, that she'd feign vertigo or fear of driving, embrace some not far off lunacy, anything to stop from having to see it again. For all her talk, coming had been easy, as simple as tossing clothes indiscriminately into her duffel bag, a screwball assortment of sweaters and tanks, thick woolen socks and linen trousers, taking the sea from Kingston Throop, knees swaying against every sudden stop, transferring in a daze, bag knocking clumsily into her calf, adjusting to the blinding hurts lighting, sterile white like a hospital room. The funeral home had been dim, but bitter cold. Once it had been a destination, a cozy beach town, book your summer holiday now. Then the turbines went up and no one wanted to be cast in shadow. Listen to their persistent spinning, a stubborn hum at the backs of their skulls. Businesses collapsed in on themselves. The steady flow of cash ran dry. The local diner shut its warped doors for good and kept them closed until the paint chipped, blistered gray from the sun. Kids busted them down eventually, splintered them to pieces. On weekends, they huddled up inside, throbbed to bass heavy tunes, then left only beer cans and cigarette buds, a jettison condom in their wake. 
They fucked in the fields at night. Every tentative kiss and sloppy grope, crouching slyly in the grasses under the audio cover of the propellers, still anxious and painfully young and hungry. Now it made sense to her why she had felt compelled to pack, why the stale invitation made defunct by a week of elapsed time and a demise that bisected it suddenly warranted action. Inside, it was the same house of her memory made anemic. The carpet, fake lawn green, had worn pale as had the wallpaper. She despised those pastel pink and blue seashells into adulthood, perhaps the only thing that stayed constant through those years. She thumbed a corner, peeling away to reveal flatwood beneath. She had already amassed five miscellaneous boxes stocked to the top with things unquestionably labeled sentimental. In one box was the picture mirror kept from her mother. So many days she had sat at her mother's dresser and stared into its surface, waiting for her face to change, for her eyelashes to grow darker, her nose retract and face the sky, her mouth awake from its permanent flatline. She merely sprouted taller, defying genetics, until she dwarfed most boys in her grade and beyond. While she grew, her mother shrank, withered took only halves of meals, chicken eaten in 50 meticulously measured bites, started dissecting apples with surgical diligence, slivering them to their molecular parts, popping each shard one by one into her parted lips, eventually refused anything at all, drank only sips of tea in even numbers, counted one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six. Claire had found her one evening in the room, the bathroom, wrestling with the tube that had been lodged permanently in her abdomen. It was a while before Claire understood what her mother had been doing, coaxing the food out, forcing the pipeline to work counter to its purpose, forcibly dispelling what precious little was keeping her alive, face steeled as she performed the role of both parasite and host, killing herself methodically, like death was discipline. She had died systematically, with careful, incremental planning, as if it were a science. Her father spontaneously, without note, fast enough to be missed, as if it were an art. Peach. There is a peach pit buried in her sternum, and she feels an overwhelming need to get it out. That is all she can focus on. Peach pit, sternum, get out. Her fingers come up browned, tarnished, from where they pull apart her chest. Pride open, an innocent dream of swallowing. Her ribs are teeth. Enclosed are more slivered segments, some tufted, displaced batting, nibbled Bic pen caps, a hollowed glass bottle, a single light bulb, and there at the back, the peach pit, like a shriveled, displaced organ. It slides lower into her lungs, her stomach. It sits there, stagnant and heavy. She amputates further, drops herself in hunks at her feet. Before long, she is nothing but scaffolding. When she wakes up, she sits soiled by her own sweat. There is a slick of urine down her leg, and it has Rorschacked across the sheets. Methodically, her head pounding, she strips the bed. The sheet, still wet, is heavy in her fists. When she throws it into the laundry room, she can swear she feels someone there, hidden in the shadows, just beyond the reach of her sight, cocooned in darkness, watching her. Sleep will not happen again. Instead, she walks around in nothing but her underwear, all the world sticking to her. She adheres to the walls of the house, bruising red on the face as she wipes herself clean with a whole roll of paper towels. It all clings. It's too close, unbearably close. She cannot get away, not from anyone, from anything, just away. Bone. She is 14 years old and her mother will die soon. The sea is in the air. It hangs above her shoulders. She feels gnats getting stuck in the slickness of her forearms, the crooks of her elbows, underneath her knees. On her hands, spots begin to boil, red and shiny. Lining the shore are cragged rocks and bushes weighted with leaves, tired and wilting. Some rocks protrude like misshapen limbs from the surface. An elbow jutting. The muted sunshine makes the world a low hum. She convinces herself that she feels something tickling her knee and she draws up her calf in straight, long scratches. Down the hill, the world splits to allow entrance to the ocean. There, the water opens wide as a mouth, vast and wet, and just beyond the orifice are the jagged teeth of the rocks. The sea is her water. 
She has only seen a river once when she was very young. Winged striders were adhered to the surface, starting searchingly back and forth. She had screamed, and her father had extracted her with urgency and taken her to the car, toweled her dry. She read later that water skippers cannibalize their young. Suddenly, mother is pointing, and she looks down to see that the pearly tip of her thumbnail is tinged a violent brown. There is a fissure up her leg like the gap in the rocks, but inside it is red. With only an exhale, her mother is there. This is a shock. Even more so is what she does, how she leans forward, planting a soft kiss along the rupture in her daughter's flesh. A kiss. This is how she remembers it. What is forgotten? The warm press of her mother's tongue, the way the muscle strained roughly against her rod skin, tasting. Hog. She is a pig being taken to the slaughter. She is wielding the knife. She is watching. She is home. She is not home. Home is not home. The house smells of her own sweat, blood, shit, heading in a snaking, alive ribbon of stench through the window gap. Her father wafts a tendril like smoke, smoking ember lit at his shoulder, shouldering unset, too late love and regret, only some of it his. His silence in this moment is unfair. Fair tufts of hair along her pig belly, one curving exposed bone. Can't you do something, she wishes to say? Something is all her pig mouth can echo, the only slippery word she can grip. When it comes out, it is only a wretched squeal, her own voice mingling with the pig's cries, a humanoid warble at the back of the throat, nothing but agony and that queasy odor. He does nothing. It is all he ever does. Her mother is the diligent, the hardworking. Mother is there, too, but new made, with the handwriting of her face gone in a second youth. Youth was better, back when she was blind to the fissures of pain in her own body, body that she broke open quietly, methodically, time and time again with determination. She smiles at her daughter and inhales the sweet smell of her skin. Her daughter, who is a brisket tucked into the supermarket cooler. Her daughter, who is the weedy grass food for the webworms. Her daughter, who is the calf on the lawn being picked clean. Mother smiles and eats of her. She watches as her mother gnaws on the meat taken from her own flank. Mother slices another, lifts it between her slender fingers, and plops it into the pink of her mouth. Her face grows hot. Blood is feverish in her cheeks. It was all she ever wanted, to nourish, be nourished. Thank you.